afternoon, everyone. Happy to see you here. I'm Roger Remington, the Yale professor. I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, continuing series of uh, presentations we have sponsored by the Yale Center for Design Studies. Uh, we call it Design Conversations. And uh, we're very uh, happy to have you here for an exciting presentation. And I'm going to, at this point, toss the ball to my colleague, Josh Owen, who will uh, introduce our guest speaker today. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Josh Owen. I'm the chair of the Industrial Design Program. We're absolutely delighted to have Gary Smith from Herman Miller with us today. He's an old friend at this point. <laughs> thrilled about that. Uh, Gary is the Vice President of Product Design and Exploration at Herman Miller Incorporated, global leader in design furnishings for working, living, and healing environments. In over two decades with Miller, Gary has developed relationships with industrial design talent throughout the world and gently guides design activities within exploration and development to continue Herman Miller's widely recognized leadership in product design. Gary's work helps represent the historical importance of design to Herman Miller's brand and culture. Prior to Miller, Gary practiced industrial design as design director at Hasbro, a leading global manufacturer of toys. His work focused on products for infants and preschoolers working with such product brands as Mr. Potato Head, My Little Pony, Weebles, and many other infant health and safety products under the Play School baby brand, many of which you probably grew up with. <laughs> um, uh, just a, a short word about uh, that, um, that quiet role that a uh, design leader like Gary brings to uh, design innovation. Uh, he works with amazingly talented designers around the world, and it's, it's the, uh, the careful <coughs> cultivation of those relationships. The, uh, he likes to say that the, the tilling of the soil uh, and the fertile ground for design, uh, which is the, uh, the vital um, work that he does. Uh, I'm privileged to have the, the uh, had the good fortune to work closely with Gary as part of the Meta Project uh, the year before this, and um, delighted to have him back uh, with us at RIT. So thank you so much for coming. Here. Thank you. Thank you. I am decked out. Yeah. Yes, you are, but turn it on. <laughs> it, it is on. Hopefully, hopefully you can hear it. Well, thanks. Thanks, Josh. Um, I am like absolutely unaccustomed. I'm usually more intimate. I'm the type of guy I want to I want to talk to you. I want to get in your eyes. And so, you know, because I'm going to be uncharacteristically using a PowerPoint, what I'd really love to see you later on. There's pizza going on. I'd like to, I'd love to chat with you and, and maybe look at you eyeball to eyeball and have a more intimate conversation. So I welcome you guys to, to come wherever it is. Is that here? In the ID area. Okay. Floor. So thank you. I'll look forward to that. Um, I'll agree, you know, um, one of the reasons I'm standing here is because over a couple of years, I really come to respect Josh, uh, know him as a friend, and, um, and I hope you guys are kind of aware, self-aware of the kind of leadership he's bringing to your design education. It's quite remarkable, and it's, it's great to see, so thank you, Josh. The second reason I'm here is because I was so inspired, and I always am, when I see real energy, passion, and commitment. The Meta Project, uh, was that four? Yeah, four, was um, a real pleasure. And uh, across the board, top to bottom, uh, the way the students challenged me, it's kind of like, I think of it as like pouring fuel back in my tank. And you know, you get into the, the daily stress of a multi-billion dollar business and um, y you as students really serve me in a way that helps sustain a career over decades and puts that energy back in. So that's uh, the other thing I'd like to say um, relative to thanks. 
And lastly, I'd like to thank a gentleman who's not here, um, my colleague at Herman Miller, former RIT graduate in design, Dan Rucker. Uh, many of you may know him. He unfortunately fell ill and uh, was unable to come, but poor Dan suffered through my vetting of thoughts and stories on your behalf. So um, if there's anything I say that makes no sense or whatever, let's all blame Dan, okay? <laughs> Okay, so, so Josh mentioned Mr. Potato Head. You know, um, it occurred to me, hey, wait a minute. This audience is probably gonna be about, you know, uh, think about what you were doing in 1982 and 1983 and four when I was working on teams doing things like Mr. Potato Head. Um, I was having incredible fun and I, I will say that um, uh, some people always ask me like, must have been a pretty, pretty stark shift from the toy design to the furniture design. And it was in many ways, but actually what really is the continuity was the deep joy I had, the deep abiding sense of serving those children and bringing joy to their lives or education to their lives. And um, that hasn't left me remarkably 25 years with Miller. Um, and um, so as guidance just to start this thing, because I'm going to level set with a few examples of work from, from that toy bit period and, and from Herman Miller, is that you'll, you'll have that self-awareness of, of the, the role, the service role that design can provide um, to, to people you'll never know. Um, I will say about Mr. Potato Head, this is a success story. Um, prior to this, uh, he, he lost some weight, he quit smoking, he got married, he had some kids, so he really turned his life around from his couch potato existence. <laughs> you caught that one, all right. <laughs> Um, just to show you that I still got it, see in the late 70s, you had to be an art major to be a designer because there were no technologies, there was no computers. So you had to, you had to learn to paint, you had to learn to sculpt. Um, and so in those days, as a fine art major, um, you know, I sketched a lot of My Little Ponies. About a year ago, a friend said, is it true you actually designed My Little Ponies? Like there was a billion of them, you may or may not know that. But um, so I said, yeah, and he says, could you sketch me a My Little Pony? And so I sat at my kitchen table. This was the first shot. This is, I just sketched this pony. And I'm like, darn, that's actually a pretty good pony <laughs> for, for not having sketched one in maybe 25 years. Um, so the time is given away. You notice every pony has a little, um, a little adornment of their hind quarter. And this is a Christmas tree with snowflakes, and her name is Noel. All right, isn't that adorable? <laughs> <laughs> or the last one I'll just share with you is, is uh, Glowworm. Now maybe, if you don't know what Glowworm is, it's this adorable little cherubic worm and you can, you can squeeze it and its face lights up. You know, and, and so you can snuggle it if you're, if you're four years old <laughs> um, and you'd see this adorable little face smiling at you in that scary bedroom. And um, I'm, I'm actually going to tell you one more kind of infant design story, but I'm going to tell that a little bit later on. Um, Although I want to digress for one moment, and just from a full disclosure standpoint, these are not my inventions. Um, and this is something you need to be prepared for in the working world, which is that most things, um, unless you're doing art, most things in design are teams of people, product teams and so forth. So um, it would be inaccurate to say, oh, I designed this or I designed Mr. Potato. It is accurate to say I was part of a preschool team which is addressing the potato head line and, and later potato head kids and glowworm and baby glowworms and things like that. That's the way that business worked. So I just want to be clear about that, that this isn't a portfolio shot. Um, what was important for me though is I, I did realize, I kind of mentioned this, that I was learning a lot from these young children. I was learning how, how um, congruent their, their emotions were with their behaviors. And when you, when you see a child um, and you realize how, um, how unfiltered that is, you, you get a very, you kind of, kind of dawn on you after a while, maybe not fully at the time, but you realize the control you have, your ability to put joy into something. And I, I was always struck by that. Um, as, I, as my career progressed, I, I keep thinking about, back to those children. I, <laughs> I once watch a child have an absolute tantrum over some toy I designed at a Toy R Us. I was secretly gleeful, to be honest with you. It was like the, the, the child was having this tantrum, screaming at mom for this toy. I'm like, go, you know. <laughs> um, 
But I thought that I would take this beginning and, and kind of weave in a whole lot of other actors into this story and hopefully reveal a little about the ethos of design at Herman Miller and, and maybe you'll learn a little bit about myself as well. Um, so a company will not be judged by its profits alone but by its impact on humanity. Um, this is a quote from DJ Dupree, the founder of Herman Miller. And I can't think of a better way to start a conversation about Herman Miller than to quote DJ. Um, some of you may or may not know that you know Herman Miller is generally acknowledged as one of the kind of preeminent brands in American design. Uh, most people know, and you'll see some images in a second, about the great mid-century work of, of the Eameses and Nelsons and so forth. Um, but the story really started in 1930 when DJ hired Gilbert Rohde um, as a designer. And, and then over all the years since 1930, with the likes of George Nelson, Charles and Ray Eames, Bob Propes, Bill Stump, Aisha Bursell to the contemporary day, Ibahar, so forth, um, there's just been great and unbroken parade of, of folks just like yourself really remarkable creative folks. I want to talk to you as peers in that conversation. I want you to place yourself there, not as this is something outside of yourself or outside of your possibility. It is. It's just us. We're designers talking to each other. So that's how I'd like you to be thinking about the way I'd like to share with you today. So I'm going to take you through a brief stroll through a little bit of Herman Miller history, and then I'll actually get to this level setting we'll help make my, the core of the presentation a little more logical, I hope. I think of this as like a design garden. So here's a Gilbert Rohde piece, designed in probably 1933 or 34. It's a residential dresser. What's important about this is at the time, uh, Miller and many other companies would send people on boats to Europe and they would sketch the fancy designs, come back and then those would be replicated or copied. Um, they were always, uh, you know, massively ornamental and comp complicated. Gilbert Rohde had a vision of modern furniture. He said, hey, in the 16th century, modern furniture was designed in, you know, the 16th century. Why are we replicating 18th century and 19th century designs here in the 20th century? Why don't we eschew ornamentation and decoration and address the honesty of operational process and materials and create beautiful, affordable, contemporary, modern furniture for the, for, for the masses? And so that was what he was kind of philosophically doing here. Um, Next, next example, these will be chronological, that was 1933 or 4. 1946, the Eames LCW, that stands for Lounge Chair Wood, um, voted by Time Magazine as the best design of the 20th century. I mean, that's just one mag's view, but I'll, I'll take it. Um, do you know it took second by any chance? Anybody know the story? The diesel locomotive. Get that, this beat out the diesel locomotive. I thought that was pretty good. Um, What's amazing about this chair, if you've never sat in one, is it's, it's rigid materials connected through kind of um, isolating elastomeric elements, i.e. rubber, uh, so, so soft interfaces, which provide this dynamic flex and this amazing comfort. Um, it's remarkably comfortable for an um, unupholstered chair. Um, this is Samu Noguchi, designed in 1948. This simple, symmetrical structure um, uh, counterposed by the asymmetry of the top. It's just an enduring beauty. This has been around for, for what, 70 years, and it's, it's gorgeous. Um, uh, the Eames Lounge in Ottoman. Um, when I showed the, the LCW a minute ago, the red chair, you have to also remember that this was occurring in the immediate um, context of World War II. There were massive material shortages, especially in steel that was going into ships and guns. And so there was innovation in materials at that time where nose cones of aircraft and pilot seats and leg splints for, for infantry were being developed out of plywood. In some ways, the LCW and the Eames um, 670 lounge here were kind of ma mature, more mature expressions of that technology kind of extrapolated to a commercial context. So I often think about things, whether you, whether you study Buckminster Fuller or whether you st study an Eames 670 lounge, you can think about it in the context of what was capable, both operationally, material, and uh, societally um, in that period. This was 1956. I had to show this. This was designed in, in 1988. This is where I work. This is, imagine the joy of walking into that building every day. 
and, and it's, it's these unprecious materials. It's poured concrete floors and knotty pine and corrugated steel and galvanized metal. And it's very unpretentious and it's a single, uh, it's a one, one story building um, and it's, it's quirky as, as all get out. But um, the quirkiness of the layout of the building re re results in all this serendipitous exchange. You have, to, you have to traverse the corridors to get through the building. It's an amazing building, and I, and I really, really enjoy working there. Um, many of you know this chair. It's the Aaron chair designed by Don Chadwick and Bill Stump. This was 1994. Um, this was never about mesh, by the way. For those of you who don't know the story, our research showed that um, one of the primary causes of discomfort in a chair actually didn't have anything to do with cushion or you know pressure on your ischial bones and, and derriere. It had to do with heat so that people would get up out of their chair if they were hot. And so the point of mesh wasn't to create a new genre. The point of the mesh was to mitigate the heat. And so this is where when we talk about human-centered problem solving um, at the center, it, it, it gives more meaningfulness to the chair. I'll tell you what, in good design and innovation is, is worth money. We, this is about, we're a public company, so you could look this up, but we do um, almost a quarter billion dollars sales in this chair on an annual basis. We make one of these every 17 seconds and pretty much have been doing that since 1994. You can do that math. Um, to, to someone who's already bought it. We don't put anything in inventory. Um, this is a leaf light. I think I have just one more after this. Um, this is designed by Eve Bahar. What was interesting about this was at the time, LEDs, we, were, lights were typically two or three LEDs with massive heat sink blocks and fans. And you'd have these big heads for the light with two or three little LEDs and minimal light output. And they couldn't use more LEDs because the heat buildup is what what destroys an LED. And, and so you had this mass and this minimal output. It's really a negative equation. What we found out we were able to do was use the blade of the, the aluminum blade to actually dissipate the heat as a sink element and then use a matrix of 20 LEDs. And then an unexpected thing happened. Because we had so many LEDs, and we didn't require fans or material mass, we were able to use warm and cool LEDs to allow shifts in color temperature and shifts in, in intensity. Um, that was pretty breakthrough back in 2007. And then the last one I'll just show you is the Setu chair. This is introduced in 2010, designed by Studio 7.5 in Berlin. Um, the core premise of this chair, if I, if I share with you the Aeron chair, was about thermal. Uh, comfort. This was about instant comfort. So that you could have a world-class chair, even like an Aeron chair, but maladjusted, it can actually be uncomfortable. If you find an Aeron chair in a conference room, you're, you're not, and you're sitting there for half an hour, you're not likely to avail yourself of the nine controls on that chair. The one control you'll probably use is the height adjustment. And so this chair only has that one adjustment, and it's designed with a, a, a very dynamic and highly engineered beam so that uh, it, it supports your body using the weight and mass of your thighs to create the, the countervailing loads for your upper body. And so it's self-leveling, if you will, or self-balancing. Um, I have to share with you the designers here did have a sentiment which showed their progression from 2010, from 2001 when they did their first chair for us, the Mira chair, to this one in 2010, which was the sentiment, um, not a molecule more than necessary. So they, they looked at everything with such a level of scrutiny to remove every molecule that was unnecessary to the performance purpose of the chair. And it really, if you, if you look historically at their work, it was really a major step for them. I've shown you all these things, both toy things and, and these things, because I, I often find myself wondering, all these years later, you think about how it is that inanimate things can be imbued with such a spirit, right? And it occurred to me, it's not actually that comp complicated. It's because you decided to put it there. That's all it is. It it's that you decided to think about the human in an empathetic way and decide to put the spirit in, right? There are so many things in this world that um, we can take or leave, that we're benign to or agnostic to, like, yeah, so what, right? It's hard to say just, it's hard to say that to the things I've shown you. 
especially if you experience them beyond just a visual image. So that's just something to, to, to think about. You, you, want to, you want to design in a way that the person who experiences that which you've created knows that you cared. All right? So this is Aisha Purcell. Absolute delight. I was just with her a couple weeks ago. And I, I want to share a brief video with you um, from her. I, I was actually going to only show the first 20 seconds, so that's a clue. I really want you to pay attention to the first 20 seconds or so. I'm actually going to let it run for three, the full three minutes because she says some things in the end about being in alignment with values that I think is, is worthwhile for the extra two minutes. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to run this video and um, I'd like you to hear what she says in the beginning especially. That's what I wanted you to hear. Okay. I'm Aisha, Aisha Bissell, and we're in New York. Over the last 15 years, her Miller has become really part of my family. You know, I grew up in Turkey, which is like a very interesting culture that's both uh, Eastern and Western backwards and forwards uh, and so it's like you're constantly looking at things from two perspectives usually opposing perspectives you know then i came to new york I, the sense of like needing to be in new york was very strong for me i don't i had no idea why but you know i had to come to new york it's a, so full of cultures and you know it's poverty and wealth you know culture and unculture at the same time, beauty and ugliness, it's like this whole environment. I was going on vacation in Turkey um, with um, Bibi and the kids, which usually are the best times for me to think things through. And so I um, put aside an hour every day to, to think and not judge what I was doing. You know, deconstruction is um, breaking something apart so that you're delinking and breaking the preconceptions um, so that you can develop a point of view. And as you shift your point of view, you can see things from a different perspective, which you can then reconstruct as a new value system. The design is imagination. And if you can imagine something, you can make it happen. And if you have a good idea, um, you can convince other people of that good idea. And so it then becomes, well, if I design my life, maybe I can build more coherence and align myself with my values. And that really is often what happens. It's making them realize their own values. And so if your values are around giving, let's say, and you look at your life and you realize there's not much giving in there. Um, you can say, well, maybe there are certain things I can do um, to have more of that. Deconstruction, this is deconstruction. You break your preconceptions and you shift your perspective from this to a new um, place. And then you figure out how to harmonize what you want and what you need, which equals value. Your life is your most important project, so why don't you do it creatively? And as a result, you can have maybe an original life. I used to be a designer of products, but I'm now a designer of life. Okay? Um, so I love that. I love that sentiment. Um, by the way, just as a comment, is we have many of these videos of about that length. Um, Eve Bahar, Don Chadwick, John Franco Zakai, many others. If you if you Google uh, HermanMiller.com/slash/why-design, 
um, that seem to be, seems to be a faster way to get there than to search through Miller. <laughs> so uh, um, check them out, they're very, they're very interesting. Um, this is another great designer, Bill Stump, uh, one of the most influential designers in our history. Uh, he, he, he did great products for us such as the world's first ergonomic task chair, the ergon chair, I think that was in 1971. He followed up that with the Equa chair um, and then uh, did the Ethospace office system and he, he already saw the Aeron chair that he did with Don Chadwick. Um, Bill had a checklist of things, it's actually 10 things and he wrote them in a little booklet. I keep this little booklet on my, on my desk and there's one that one of his little checklists, each of these 10 things were, he would say, more often than not, if the design exhibits these characteristics, it's probably good work, okay? One of the ones that has meant the most to me and seems to come up most in conversation at Herman Miller is this, to advance the art of living. Uh, that's, isn't that another beautiful phrase? It's like, um, it's like being a designer of life um, he expanded that to say that each new Herman Miller product needs to improve either productivity, comfort, health, or enjoyment. And so now let's think back to DJ, um, that our work will be judged on its impact to humanity. Let's think about Aisha. I'm a designer of life. Let's think of Bill. Can you advance the art of living? Can, can, you, can you see the theme here? None of, these, none of these designers are talking about things. They're talking about human experience, okay? Yes, the human experience is intermediated by the things which exist in our life. You know, um, our clothing, our furniture, our vehicles, our architecture. But it's very important in telling that from the founding voices of the company to um, some of the great design voices that we've brought in to the house, so to speak, that they're, they're talking about the creation of human experience. And so, uh, what I'd like to do is tell you five very short stories that are personal to me, and I hope, I hope across the spectrum, they go from young to old, and they go, hopefully express um, ways in which you'll see the power of design. Um, the first story I'm gonna call an infant. Look at that baby. I gotta tell you, I gotta interject here. The toy business was great. Like, why are you going back to the toy business? Because only in the toy business could you be working on Mr. Potato Head in the morning and a rectal thermometer in the afternoon. <laughs> okay, that's quite a fun range. And so, of course, I decided to tell you about the rectal thermometer. Okay, um, so mom and dad's out there, you can raise your hand. Few of you have children. Well, for those of you who don't, you have a special moment awaiting you at some point, hopefully. You know that this taking an infant's rectal temperature wasn't your favorite moment. Remember, there was a time when there were no forehead swipes and ear probes. You know, you, know, you, had, a, you had an analog thermometer. And um, you have this squiggly, wiggly little infant. And for a parent, you're not a doctor. This amounts to a quasi-medical procedure. Right, you, you have this, this nervousness about it. And so, you know, at, I'm at play school and we, we realized that we could do something amazingly simple. We had an epiphany. We simply took away the biggest fear. I'll say it, how far, okay? <laughs> we introduced the use of clear medical grade silicone. Um, which was both soft, warm, and clear, so you could know it was cleaned and it was comfortable and so forth. The result was an experience that was far less stressful for mom. Uh, the baby is, you know, am, you know uh, ambivalent to this. Um, but by removing the stress from the parent, you've probably enabled a more ac accurate temperature, and that's actually the performance we sought here. And so humbly I'd submit that this is a very small act of human empathy in the manner of a rectal thermometer. It's designing for life, okay, real life. My second story is about my friend's daughter, Maria. Maria started her life dealing with two liver transplants before the age of six. She's now a teenager uh, and doing very well. 
But this room was typical of the rooms or environments that she spent a great deal of her young life, and by her parents' estimation, approximately four of her six years. Imagine that. You notice this is not a room with fairies and My Little Ponies and, and Winnie the Pooh. This was her room. And it was probably a little bit scary, although I'm always amazed at the resiliency and adaptability of children. At Herman Miller, what we tried to do, we wondered if great design could improve the ambience of the room while still dealing with all the clinical necessities of an acute care environment. Um, or maybe even, not just dealing with the necessities, but maybe even improving care like that thermometer. So improving the ambience of the room was part of what was our work. This was a Compass healthcare system designed by John Franco Zakai with Continuum out of Boston. And the, the finishes of all the details of this room uh, somehow make it a little less scary, a little less, um, uh, a, a little more familiar to what you might see in a residential place, but dealing with what Herman Miller is really great at, which is systemic, you know, um, thinking. Um, it's got all the same equipment as the room you saw a moment ago with Maria, but it somehow seems quieter, calmer, more relaxing. But th the real beauty actually is in the details. I'm going to share a couple of them. They seem like minor things. Um, for example, this design includes a, a flexible drawer pull so that um, a, pa a patient won't bruise a thigh, an unsteady patient is walking in that room, bumps into this, that, that drawer pull is soft and flexible and has a place to go in the receiving area of the drawer front. Um, also, there's a new technology in the United States. These were completely seamless. There is no edge banding on these fronts uh, so that you don't want little grungies, you know, getting in that space over time between the laminates and the edge banding. We even designed the shape of the um, tiles and the drawer fronts to avoid the capillary beha behavior of liquids, be that bodily liquids or cleaners or anything else. So every little detail, including understanding how water um, behaves on the surface of this material was considered to make it as uh, hygienic as possible. I love this story. We even rethought something as simple as a sink. If you look carefully, the, the, the faucet of the sink comes back on itself. And as the water exits the faucet, it falls into an asymmetrical sink, which, which changes the way the water splashes in the sink. We did studies, many studies, of hand washing for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute, with pieces of paper. We measured the diameter and distance and quantity of every one of those splashes. That's the kind of detail we went through and created the, the, the front curvature and the slope of the sides and all these kinds of things all because what we're dealing with is a clinical environment. We're trying to make it as healthy as possible. In all, you know, it's a very thoughtful application of design and we, we, we can create a more graceful ex a human experience through the calmness of it, yet perhaps even make a healthier room. How about that? We can do these, bo both of these things. My next story is about Jackson. Um, this is Jackson here being held as a 12-year-old uh, by his father. Jackson is now a young adult. Um, and I've never met Jackson, but I've been told that his, he's, he's got autism. And it's severe enough that as a young man, he's never yet been able to have a conversation with his father. Um, you can imagine uh, learning environments prevent a very severe sensory challenge for children like Jackson. Squeaking furniture, screeching chairs, uh, glaring work surfaces, the, these create an impossibility in a learning environment for someone like Jackson. And frankly, you know, I don't like screeching chairs and glaring work surfaces either. So good design for people with sensory uh, uh, disabilities um, is good design for all of us. Um, his father here, um, along with a couple friends in, in the design profession, have decided to make a difference um, in the design of the primary classroom, primary education classroom. I've just been providing a little bit of coaching. Um, by focusing on a classroom designed around children with sensory uh, challenges, um, they, they're looking at all the senses we know, you know, touch and sight and hearing, but also uh, you may have not heard this word, vestibulatory sense, which is really the sense of movement. 
um, rocking and motion and so forth, and then also proprioception, which is really um, your sense of your body, your muscle musculature awareness, and your sense of space. Like why I know I don't walk into this column, right? I, my, I have a sense of where the edges of my body are. By combining classic ergonomy with a vestibulatory thinking and proprioception, they've created a new a language that they call integrated ergonomy which is a holistic view of all of these aspects. We're actually intrigued by even the additional layer of what we might call emotional ergonomy and how all of these layers can build to a redefinition of what, what the, the very de definition of ergonomy. And um, it, it's, it's really laudable work. It's very difficult work. And, um, but it's an example of the kind of work going on where um, Though the end isn't necessarily in sight, the, um, the empathy for human experience is clearly there. Um, my next story is of James. James is my nephew. James is an Army captain and a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. Uh, James has tour, uh, done three tours of duty, two in Afghanistan and one in Iraq. He is in arguably a very elite class of men who are among the most fit and motivated men in the world. He's unbelievable. What's his story? This perfectly fit young man flies a multi-million dollar aircraft and he and pilots like him occasionally fly very long missions. A long mission for a helicopter pilot would be in excess of eight to ten hours. Um, due to poor ergonomics of the cockpit, it's an unbelievable fact that after such a mission, men like him have to literally be carried out of the aircraft, unable to walk. They are unable to um, deal with bodily functions. They're unable to move. They've got their two feet on mobile platforms. They've got a control stick to their rear left where they've got one between their legs. They've got a 20 pound helmet with their head cranked up. They can't hit buttons and switches behind their head. It's incredible. I almost defy you to sit in that position for three minutes. So the seats are essentially the same technology as was used during Vietnam. Um, and the control interfaces are atrocious. Just as an FYI, the cost of this chair in that aircraft is like $30,000. So I want you to remember that number because I'm going to reference something a bit later. So believe me, I understand that the performance envelope of a military aircraft is, is more about survivability than comfort. I get that. Um, the problem with the picture though is that you don't see there's a man intended to sit in the chair, right? And I, I was actually called to Washington, D.C. It was kind of spooky. I, I went underground to some level. I, I don't know. But I was speaking with several hundred fully decorated officers from all branches of the military. And uh, I was asked to share Herman Miller, little old Miller, you know, to share our approach to design and help the United States figure this out. Um, what, was, uh, what transpired in the conversation was that I learned that their goals were bullets on targets. And it occurred to me later, you know, you're thinking this in real time, you're presenting a design approach by Herman Miller, but the challenge is more than bullets on targets or survivability, actually. It's putting the human in the cockpit at the start of the design process. And you'd think a healthier, um, more comfortable pilot would perform better. Um, meanwhile, with far less resources, here's Miller, which is always exploring new technologies and seating. I, I thought this was a pretty cool shot because this is an example of the journey Miller goes through. I don't know if you're familiar with the sail chair, but I'll show you a picture in a moment. The, the images you see here happen to be various generations of prototypes for our recent seating introduction, the sail chair. It was designed by Eve Bahar um, uh, with a Fuse Project out of San Francisco. Um, this is the chair here. Um, and w one thing that's pretty remarkable about this, it's, it's beautiful, it's comfortable, it's a great value. These are about $300, okay? And I, our brief asked Eve Bahar whether he could create, it's kind of funny, we asked him, hey, could you create a chair that would be, would have enough honor that we could actually put the brand on it? Can you create a $300 chair that isn't so cheap that we would lack integrity in putting that red dot on that chair. He actually um, responded to that brief 
and in essence implored us not to, not to act on the solution. He said, with all due respect, um, you're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, can the brand go that low? The question is, can you elevate the art of what's possible for $300? Okay, great reframing and great, a great lesson for us in that moment. Um, it's, it's the trust that we put in our design partners that we can be spoken to in that way and be clarified um, and enriched by it. It's a radically different approach to the problem. Can you elevate what's possible for $300? Um, if, you know, you think if the aircraft designer started from, I mean, if somebody gave me $30,000 to design chair, I'd figure that out. Um, so hopefully the military moves slowly, I'm learning. So that, that story is ongoing, but um, hopefully there'll be on the, for the benefit of pilots, um, there'll be real progress there. So, you know, I'm like the patient room with the thermometer, hopefully in all of these examples, there's a performance element. It's human-centered problem solving. It's about performance. You don't get to, you don't get to decide that that's a choice. You ha it's a both and. And this last story is about my grandma. This is my grandmother and, her, and my grandpa. As you can see, she was a beautiful woman. She was born in Rome, and she immigrated through Ellis Island, um, best I can tell, in the early 30s. And this is Anna and Henry. Um, almost anyone would agree. They happen to be Italian. Oh, I just told you that, they were from Rome. So food, big deal. And, and, and whether you're from Rome or not, we all just came from the holiday weekend. We, everyone would agree on the importance of food to a culture and to the social dynamic of family gatherings. It was just so hilarious. You know, my whole childhood growing up, this is the, like the scene in my mind. Aunts and uncles and siblings and cousins and parents and grandparents. And it was every occasion with my grandmother was a festival of, a festival of food. <laughs> I joke, but it's true, as a teenager, I'd go over to my grandmother's house to mow her lawn and somehow I'd be eating a salami sandwich. I don't know how that occurs, you know. But this is what I remember. And this persisted until very late in her life. Um, I'm telling this story because this isn't the, the greatest photograph, but I love this photograph. It's just the technology um, of kind of digitally recreating stuff. I, I, I have this photograph because it's like this is this is what my head sees when I see my grandmother. She was always smiling like this. But grandma suffered from Alzheimer's. And while she always remained cheerful, like in this picture, the disease caused her to lose her ability to safely cook, taking away one of the great joys of her life. And I've wondered since, did that have to be so? I'm not so sure. And I'll tell you why. Because the stove on the right is the stove that I remember. That's not the stove, but it was like this stove. That was what she cooked on for decades. It's pretty simple. It's got you know five knobs, one for each burner, and high and low, and one for the uh, one for the oven. And um, they were all where she could reach them. And I should mention she was only like four foot ten. Okay. On the right is a stove, the, typical of the one I remember in the house that she moved into to be nearer to my mom and dad so you know we could care for her and help her with the house and so forth. There they were, still four burner knobs, but they're black on black in the back where she could barely reach them. And, and this wasn't actually a problem initially. Um, I, I don't think anyone at the time thought about this, but you know, it was just grandma getting older oops, forgot to turn the stove off, or these kinds of things. But had we eye, had the eyes to see it, we, we could have we done a kindness by either keeping the old stove or getting a stove that was like the old stove that she could understand and operate. And we could have we enabled, I'm not sure, but we probably could have enabled my grandmother to continue that joyful behavior, that joyful activity in her life. I, in some ways I think that the designer of the stove and, and we as a family were probably thinking about style, but we weren't thinking about grandma, you know? And so let, I just want to check in. So we, infants and Maria and Jackson, James, my grandmother, 
Can you see that all these stories are related because they reveal the empathy in the designer? Just like us. We have that choice and we have that responsibility. Um, now there's a sixth story um, that I want to tell you, but I can't. Um, because the story's not yet written. And that story's about you. I want you to really think about whether you'll consider whether a student, a practicing professional, an educator, um, whether you're willing, as Aisha said, to, to be a designer of life, or from Bill, to advance the art of living, to allow your, to, you to, to believe that your work is connected to humanity. Please consider setting aside your ego for a moment, perhaps for a lifetime, and seizing the privilege of designing a new world of beautiful experiences through that which you create. Um, I'm sure you will. I hope you will. And I wish you well in it. Um, I sincerely do. Thank you. Let's take some questions. Okay. I'd love to. Okay. I'd love to. Um, thank you so much, Gary. You're um, welcome. Gary's uh, willing to take some questions, so if we have any. You can ask me about my hardware. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Learn. <laughs> Gary, when you went from Hasbro. Um, to Herman Miller, was there a job in between, or, or, um, or how hard was that transition? Because sometimes designers can get stereotyped into a particular area of a profession. Mm -hmm. So how did you make that transition? Yeah, um, it, it, it was interesting. So the answer is yes, there was a intermediary company. Uh, you know, with the Harry Potter movies, there's that character that, that he who must not be named. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. But I won't do. I won't play that game. I, I was actually a toy designer at Hasbro. Later, we 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 acquired the Play School brand, so I was working in the infant and preschool products. When I came back to Michigan, I came back because I, my wife and I started our family, and that those family gatherings with my grandparents were so important such an important part of my life. They were all alive and I wanted my children to grow up in the context of their great grandparents and grandparents. So quite literally with tears in my eyes I left the toy business. I loved it that much and by the way I hope, I pray that you will love your job so much that it will bring you to tears when, when you walk out because you make a life decision. You'll be blessed if, if that's uh, the, the case for yourself. So I left the toy business and I came back to Michigan where the family was and I was a, re a resident staff uh, with Hayworth. Okay, so I was, a, I was a furniture designer for the Hayworth company, also in the Holland, Michigan area for a couple years. Um, as a weird kind of byline, it wasn't so stark for me because in the late 70s I was interning for almost a year at Steelcase. So I'm probably a rare designer who's been employed by Steelcase, Hayworth, and, and Herman Miller. Um, at least I haven't found anyone else um, that has had that experience. So I knew because of a year at Steelcase um, that furniture meant a lot to me. And if you think about it, um, perhaps other than our homes, maybe the, the intimacy of our apparel, I mean what we place on our very bodies, but furniture um, is maybe the next most intimate thing. The, the, the intimacy of the interface with our bodies, we sleep on it, we sit on it, we dine at it, we're with our friends, right? Furniture is so intrinsically connected to our human experience that, that that resonated with me. And so in some ways, the empathy for a child, like I dare you to design for an infant and be, um, uh, t to lack empathy, it's impossible. And so when you start with the perfect job, which was in the toy business and realizing the deep joy and responsibility of designing for children, um, when I moved to the furniture business, I just made a choice. I simply said, if I can't bring that level of integrity to the work, I'll have the honor to walk out the door. 
What, to my great delight, I found was that 25 years at Herman Miller and those couple years also at, at Hayworth that were after my toy career, that I've found a deep joy in um, knowing that there's tens of thousands of people who, are su who will suffer good or ill based on the work that I do with our design partners. That's quite a privilege and it's, it's never been lost on me. So though the clock speed was radically different, I mean you could, I could sketch a dinosaur or a pony and you know four months later it's on a blister card selling for <laughs> $4.99. Um, you get into the furniture business, it was kind of like, hey, in January, we ought to set up a meeting sometime before the end. <laughs> <laughs> so the clock speed was a little hard to get used to. And, and now I'm on the, uh, the suffering, the other side of that. Now, as a vice president of exploration, you, we can't possibly do things quickly enough. Um, so we're always pressured to be more efficient, more thoughtful, more discerning. So, um, there were amazing continuities because design, whatever you decide to go into, whether it's consumer designs or furniture, or fashion, you're serving. This is, I meant what I said about the ego. This is not about you. It's really not. If it's about you, go do your art, right? I'm a fine arts major. I can appreciate the comment. I do art and when I paint, I don't care if my mom likes the painting. When I'm designing, it's not about me, nor you. You are in a service model, okay? The service you're providing may be joy, beauty, performance, comfort, health. I had such a great, is, is Wendell in here? Oh, I, had such a, I had such a great joy to be hosted by Wendell Castle this morning in the studio. Wendell's bringing his gifts to the world in a way that are completely unique from my gifts and completely legitimate. Right, there's room, there's room for it. But don't, don't be disingenuous to the privilege, respect it. And so toy design, furniture design, there's this grand continuity that's beautiful. And it's, it's bigger than the subject matter to which you apply your talents. At least that's one man's point of view. So, any other, sure. Yeah, so two questions I'll answer briefly. Um, we, one of the gentlemen we work with was a former Olympic downhill skier who, who broke his back. This sounds like a weird roundabout way to answering the question, <laughs> but I'm talkative, okay. Uh, his name's Dr. Brock Walker. So he broke his back and to solve his own problems, he became an expert, became a chiropractor and a doctor. And, um, and so he, he uh, does some amazing research that informs uh, the ergonomy of our present, day, our present day seating. Dr. Brock knows everybody. He raced with Fa Franz Klammer in the 72 Olympics. He knows, he knows uh, Bodie Miller. He, know, he knows everybody and he actually designed the seat for Gordon Johncock when Gordon Johncock won the Indy 500 uh, a, a month after being completely disabled in a horrific accident. And, and if you listen to the replay, Google this, the replay of the finish of that race, um, the announcer saying, and here's Gordon Johncock winning the race in that crazy seat of his. That crazy seat was designed by Brock Walker. Brock Walker ended up making a connection with an admiral in the US Navy who said, man, you need to talk to these fine folks over here at Herman Miller. That's how I had the privilege of going to Washington and talking to them about how a little company like Miller, by comparison to the US government, can, <laughs> can do some amazing things like the Aeron chair and the Setu chair and the Mira chair and the Sail chair. Right? So that's how that connection occurred. That came by invitation. They were, we, we were asked to speak to them. And um, uh, I'm sorry, but this is a bit of a digression. When I was in the toy business, I, we, were, we launched G.I. Joe. And one of my friends was a sculptor. He sculpted my face. So my face is actually, uh, I'm like 10 million G.I. Joes out there. <laughs> so the reason this is relevant, I know it's kind of weird. See yourself as a five inch doll. but. Um, <laughs> 
so I'm introduced to the US military in this amphitheater with all these people in uniform as GI Joe. Like you can imagine my I was, I was mortified. It's a little <laughs> less disarming here because you're not in uniform. Um, but most most of our design assignments come from research that Miller has done where we come to a point of view about you might say our irrelevancy. We say, man, we should be we should be dealing with this and we're not. And, um, and so all of the work with Josh and Eve and Aisha, those kinds of folks, I spend, I spend literally years getting to know them so I know um, it's like finding the pearl within. I'm trying to understand so intimately, might I defer my spirit? I, remember I made that quote? Uh, a deferential spirit to design provocation. Like think about any relationship. Can you defer your spirit to one you don't trust? So you must establish the trust and the willingness attitudinally to defer one's spirit to the provocation coming from design. That can only be done in a, in a, in a relationship that's more than transactional. DJ would have called it covenantal. And so we seek intimate relationships with those whom we can trust implicitly. And then we share we share our worries, our fears, our business with them and then seek to do something important together. Now here's what interesting happens though, the, the, the real piece of the question. For those whom we have that kind of a relationship with, we find ourselves able to hear their voice in a way that's different from what I'll call unsolicited submissions. I get perhaps 500 unsolicited submissions a year. I'll go back to my office tomorrow late and there'll be 12 from this week. And most of them are, hey, you should make my coffee table. <laughs> hey, you should make my light. I don't care about the coffee table or, or the light. You know what I care about? I care about the person who created the thinking that created the coffee table or the light. When I tell them, I'm not interested in your thing, I'm interested in you, you who created the thing. So I'm not shopping for ideas. What I'm looking for is gray matter. I'm looking for intellect. I'm looking for empathy and thoughtfulness and provocation. That's what I'm hiring. Okay? So, yes, they're normally outbound design briefs to those whom we trust. Occasionally, I'll get something that is so remarkable to me from someone I don't know that it, it um, causes me to pick up that phone or even get on a plane and get to know this remarkable person who put that on my desk. And then the story begins. Okay? There was a, yeah, question over here. Um, you mentioned painting. I'm curious what other kinds of uh, hobbies or activities you do outside of your work. Oh, boy. Um, I love to get, uh, it's kind of weird, have every, any of you ever heard of adventure racing? Do you know what adventure racing is? It's kind of cool. It's, it's, um, it's races that are 12, 20, 30, 40 hours long, and it includes generally kayaking or paddling, mountain biking, and deep woods orienteering. And it involves nutrition, psychology, technical aptitude, strategy. You know, you can decide at two in the morning after racing for 15 hours whether to hold your bike over your head and, and ford the swamp, or ride the bike three miles down to the bridge and come back if you don't want to get wet because it's 50 degrees out. That's a strategic choice. Fantastic. So Google adventure racing. Don't do it if you don't like leeches and mud, okay? Um, so that's what I like to do. Um, a little bit less on the extreme side um, is just um, snowshoeing, mountain biking. M my wife and I are very active. We do a lot of kayaking. Um, and we live right, here's my Michigan map. I live right here on the west coast of Michigan. So, you know, uh, half a mile away is the shore. And so um, we spend a lot of time on the water. So that's, that's kind of what I like to do. So, way back in there, I'll get you, Alex. Yeah. I'm, I, I know when the designer decides to tell me the truth. I'll tell you a little story. Um, I once was talking to a designer 
and you know, you're hearing me now for, for an hour or whatever, and I was talking about this deferential spirit to provocation and there's responsibility and human empathy and I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand like, boy, we're missing each other. I'm thinking this, I'm not saying, it. I'm like, man, I still haven't cracked that nut. <laughs> and finally he says, this is a true story, he says, I'm like, I'm mid-sentence, I'm saying something, are you a, and he goes, I'm time out. He says, I'm just looking for billable hours. And that's what he said. I, I, I'm so, I don't know what we're talking about, but I'm just looking for billable hours. You got any? I'm like, bingo. We're not communicating. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um, and I said to him, you know what I said to him? I, that's what I thought, but here's what I said. Thank you. Thank you for telling me the truth. I don't have anything I need right now for a transactional couple of hours um, that you seek. But when I do, and sometimes I do, I know who to call. Okay? Now here's the real introspection. You know, you can imagine, it's easy to get judgmental, like, how dare this guy walks in just like, I don't even know him. You got some, you know, you got some work for me? Like, who are you? Right? The real issue wasn't him at all. The real issue was when I thought about that last, th that night, is I finally did my job. What is that? I put that designer in a position to tell me his truth. In this case, it was a he, right? I could do no better. It took me 45 minutes for me to finally do my job, right? And so for each one of you, if you ever find yourself uh, in a position to be working with Herman Miller, I know they're hireable when they will stand convicted and truthfully express themselves. Absent that, they're a pair of hands. I can buy, I can buy beauty all day long. There's guys who can style it up. I don't care about that. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for any clue, young or old, that this person is prepared to stand in front of a multi-billion dollar organization and speak the truth. Their truth. Why? Because we have a, we have a deferential spirit to the provocation. That's why. It all kind of knits together. Okay? By the way, I should probably, full disclosure, you know, we fail at this all the time. <laughs> right? You'd think I was lying. We do. We, we have these fantastic aspirations in this poetry of history and this narrative, advanced the art of living, and it's wonderful. It's inspiring. That doesn't mean we succeed at that all the time. That would be a lie. But it's great to have an aspiration to which you can aspire, right? Alex, you had a question? Yeah, um, so as more and more designers are, you know, entering executive positions in the boardroom, and, and you as a designer yourself, how do you define design leadership? And how do you think that's different from leadership in general? Um, the general answer is it's not different. Um, I think leadership is a service model. I think where I see things go awry is when any leader, design leader, or a business leader um, forgets that um, those who are led are inspired to, to follow. Um, that most, many kind of ills of the world are through uh, kind of directive and control and power. So if you can imagine um, a gentle, uh, I, I do try to lead in a gentle way. I'm going to allow you, um, don't, I will say, don't patronize me. I don't have forever. I, you know, if we're gonna have a design conversation, I'm not gonna give you the second try, the third try, the fourth try to find out what p pushes my buttons until I, until I smile or something. I'm looking for your truth, whether I get it or not. And so from a leadership point of view, I think that the best thing I could do is put the designer in a position to reveal that truth, re reveal their intellect, reveal their vision. And then we can make a, a real quality business decision. We need this or we don't, right? And everyone can, can stand there on that ground and say, hey, it's, it's not personal. 
We've got a, we're a public company. We have a business to run. So I, I think um, maybe it's different for other companies, you know, but uh, through Herman Miller's history, a DJ was a very quiet um, uh, man. And if you can imagine this very uh, pillar of the, of the Christian Reformed community in Zealand, Michigan, a very conservative area of the company, and he, he hires this, uh, the cigar smoking wrangler from New York, George Nelson. Right? Like, how on earth did those two guys exist in the same room? Right? Um, do you think how long would George Nelson lasted if there was a bombastic DJ giving him directives on what it meant to lead design? DJ quietly allowed himself to be guided by George's leadership and was willing to defer that spirit, as I said. So that's kind of how I think about leadership in general. Um, people, people want leadership. It's not, a, it's not a dirty word. It's only a dirty word when it becomes an abuse of power. So that's how I think about that. Any other thoughts or conversations? If you, if you look, I know um, if you're not one to want to stand up in 100 people, um, again, we'll have time, catch me conversationally over a mouthful of pizza. That'd be great too. Um, but uh, I'll just, any last questions? If not, I really, oh, there's one back here, so, yeah. Um, have you ever had a design problem where you felt like you weren't completed, or you had to finish it, but you were forced to move on to another project? That's a, that's a challenge that we face on every project. It really is. Um, it's no different than, you know, this, the, the cadence of the midterm and the, and the final and you know you find yourself asking is it good enough right I, there is a test um, I, I talk to everything I talk to students in elementary settings and high school settings so sometimes when I get really simple and I don't mean to uh, patronize this audience more mature but I'll just give an example of a cup so here's a cup and it, this hopefully will answer the question. Um, paper cup, glass cup, ceramic cup, hollowed out rock. Does any of that matter? What matters? If this, if this cup leaks, is it a cup? It's no cup. A leaky cup is the same thing at that, as a boat that doesn't fly, or a boat that doesn't float, or a plane <laughs> that doesn't fly. Yeah, okay. That would be interesting. <laughs> a leaky cup lacks integrity. So another way of saying a more sophisticated way, the Aeron chair. I told you, we build one of those every 17 seconds to someone who's already bought one. Okay? We don't put any in inventory. There was a story, it's a true story, I've seen it, where when that chair was introduced in 1994, um, I don't know if it came from marketing or where it came from, but someone said, oh man, this chair is great. If we had an executive version of the Aeron chair, a leather padded, <laughs> we could sell a million of them. So we built one. We built two of them actually. They're in our archives. Leather padded Aeron chair. And do you know, because of the brand, you know the cachet of that brand, the Aeron franchise. If we made leather padded air on chairs and marketed it to senior executives for hierarchical reasons, their own vanity, we, we're a public company. We could probably sell tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of air on chairs. But guess what? What we found out was a leather air on chair is hot. <laughs> <laughs> We've never sold one. That's one of the reasons why I'm still at Miller, because it's a company that has the integrity to not sell a leaky cup. So if it's good enough, what you have to know is at the very center of the design is that thing which is so central, what I call the core conceptual premise. The core premise, the transport of a small bit of liquid from here to there. This is not a wash basin, this is not a bucket, it's not a bathtub. This has to be scaled to the size of a hand that can reach around it. It has to be scaled to the strength of a human arm. These are all in the calculation. If I can't lift it, if I can't grasp it, if it leaks, all of those are demarcations of a design that lacks legitimacy and ought not be done. So 
it could always be better. We could take that last bit, that, that additional molecule out of the equation. What you need to decide as a designer as you look at your own work is does it have integrity to its very reason for existence? And there's no doubt that it'll never be, per within that envelope, you'll probably never perfect it because of constraint. Time constraint, investment constraint, all, all other kinds of constraints. Those are real. Don't try to be agnostic to that. You just deal with it. But have the, have the integrity to call something um, as lacking truth if that's in fact the case. That's kind of how I, how I think about it. When I was saying, when someone asked me a, a question about a chair, it doesn't matter whose chair it was, and they, said, they asked me, um, this actually happened to me a couple times. I was asked this about a Geary building as well. But in this case, I'll tell you the story of a chair. Do you think that chair is beautiful? I said, why, I don't know. I haven't sat in it. You see, a, a, a beautiful chair that's uncomfortable to sit in is pretty damn ugly from my point of view. So the, 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 the first purpose of a chair is to support the human body not to exist as a form from my point of view. So those can be coalesced. You can be beautiful and comfortable. So I hope those are ways of expressing um, the challenge on every project. Like, do you know when it's done? And it's, it's almost never done. And even like Studio 75, who did the mirror chair, um, and then 10 years later did the Satu chair, they had come to be much more acutely aware of each and every molecule that was part of the experience they were creating. Was there a question over here? Uh, yes. yes sir. Um, when you're talking about ergonomics, I was wondering, have you ever struggled with people who wanted to sacrifice ergonomics for the sake of aesthetics? And if so, how did you deal with that in a way that was not contentious and help resolve to a solution? Um, sacrificing could you hear the question? We were asked about whether we've ever been confronted by sacrificing ergonomics for the sake of aesthetics. Or people who wanted to do that, like someone say in or... Yeah. Um, uh, the, the answer is everything is messy. There, there's always a set of kind of countervailing arguments to almost every argument. And so if, if, you know, if you have this kind of Pollyanna version of what design is, like you sketch it, and then you mock it up, and then you build it in full scale, and then someone makes it, that's not what happens. It is in a macro sense. But what actually happens is at each stage, it's vetted by more and more voices who, who want, and this isn't designed by committee, by the way, but, but they're real voices. People who from their point of view are speaking to the re relevancy from their point of expertise. And so um, there is, um, when you think of the population for whom the design is intended, like the, 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 the radical range of human bodies um, and physical um, states in a healthcare environment is radically different than the kind of human body that exists in a corporate B&B, &B, you know, business to business environment. Um, uh, I was telling Josh, we were talking about this the other day because we were talking about healthcare. You know, you may not have an eye or an arm or a leg, um, but you're going to be healthy. You know, that's irrelevant. If you're in an office environment, you're probably healthy enough to be there, re regardless of what your, your you, know, uh, you know, the presence of a finger, right? In healthcare, it's completely different. The, I don't expect three month old children and 90 year old people in my business environment. Right? So if you think of human population, the business environment is like a sliver of a human population and therefore what one might need to consider relative to what's appropriate ergonomically has to deal with the 400 or 600 pound man as well as the, the 70 pound adolescent. So sometimes there's just no way within that envelope to optimize ergonomy for all. So you, you're knowingly, you're, I wouldn't call it a sub-optimization. I would really call it, call it as being um, kind of truthfully addressing the constraint. In this case, the range of human population to be accommodated. So 
to the extent that we can and what we can afford. I mean, there's millions of dollars of capital and tooling and all this kind of stuff. We always try to do our best, but, but we also, as a public company, there's people who have, you know, put in good faith, put their money in Herman Miller stock and hoping to, you know, pay for a child's education or, or their retirement. So we have to be really respectful of the stewardship of that money and make sure that while something might be perfected, the actual service in this empathy conversation I've been telling you about, that the gains become so minuscule that they don't warrant the negative sides of the delay or the capitalization. So it's always messy. But we, you know, you try to find where that, the correct crossover is. So, um, I, I just want to be conscious of time. I'll get your question, but don't be, you know, if you got to run, um, please don't feel compelled to stay. <laughs> but if, if this is interesting, I'm happy to. One last question, and then I'm going okay. to invite everybody to come and have pizza. We've got pizza for 300. So <laughs> <laughs> come up to the IV uh, studios on the fourth floor. Here to mingle with you. Let's, let's take one last question, and then you can. Uh, yes, please. Uh, so you keep touching back on honesty. Yeah. Right. You keep touching back on the importance of honesty and truthfulness. Um, how did that value become so important to you? Um, how did honesty and truthfulness become so important to me? Um, this is going to be a weird way to answer the question. Um, my dad was a musician. And one of the things, and so from a young child, like eight years, seven years old, something like that, I started playing an instrument. And what I really love to do is play improvisationally, basically jazz. And there's like a channeling when you're, when you're playing improvisationally, you're, you're so in the moment, so committed that there isn't judgment. You don't have time for, for, for the judgment. And what I, what I found was, remember I talked about that the children, when I, what I learned from the children is they're so they're so channeled in that way. There's, so, there's such a lack of filtration between, between what they perceive their experience to be and how they express that emotionally. I was, I was just, it happened to me my first job. I mean, how lucky is that? I was just stunned by how clear that was. I didn't have a child at that time. I was only, you know, 21. But it was so obvious. Um, I remember one little kid, it was a toddler, so this was speaking by this time, and I designed some toy, and he said something like, I'll paraphrase, this toy's yucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that, Johnny. <laughs> I mean, it was. It was to him, and we didn't do it. I, I just think the, you know, the life I've lived, the, 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 the parenting I've had, um, the experiences I've had, it just seems like... Um, if we can, as we relate to each other, as we create experiences for each other, that if we can remove the posturing, and if we can remove the ego, and deal at a very human level, that seems what, to me, like what humanity needs. And it, um, it makes it real clear, it makes it really easy to make decisions. You know, you don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to, debate too much. A cup leaks. Truthfulness or lack of truthfulness to what a cup should be. A pencil cup, I don't care if it leaks. But a water cup, I do. So I don't really know. It's a very interesting question. You'll cause me, that will, the question will cause me to ponder that on my flight home. So thanks for that homework. <laughs> well, let's join you upstairs and uh, so enjoy much. some pizza. You're welcome.